I'm already prepared. Welcome to another RD Works Learning Lab. A fairly technical session today, which we're going to carry out in the office here. We're not going anywhere near the workshop. So, your laser machine comprises of three main elements. Forget the machine, we've got the laser beam. Forget the tube, the beam is the most important thing. The lens is the next most important thing. And finally, the material. Those are the three things that go to make up your laser machine. You need an understanding of the lens. You need an understanding of what you're firing at the lens. You need an understanding of what comes out of the lens and how it affects the material. So you need a bit of an understanding of the material that you're firing at. That's why those are the three main elements that go to make up the technology of laser cutting. Now, one of the things that I'm beginning to discover as I do more and more experimental work with lenses is that without being arrogant, lens theory doesn't go anywhere near far enough to explain what happens when we use a laser machine for cutting it begins to describe what happens when we use it for engraving because everything tends to be focused down onto the surface of the material and that's all we need for engraving. But as I've tried to describe to you in several previous sessions, what happens below the focal point is certainly not covered by the basic idea of lens theory and diverging beams below the focal point. But that's a separate issue. We've got more to discover on lenses and I've got some interesting experiments lined up for the future on that. But today I felt it was rather important that you understand what your laser beam is. Because if you bought your laser machine through eBay or maybe through Amazon Marketplace, I can 100% guarantee that you've got a crap tube in your machine. It will not be an A-grade top quality tube. It may come from a top quality manufacturer, but that's not the same as having a top quality tube. So we're going to go into those sorts of things shortly, and we're going to describe how and why it's very, very important for you to know what the quality of your beam is, because you have only bought one machine. You've only ever had one tube. You've got nothing to compare it with. Now, I don't know whether it's uh, an advantage or uh, a burden, but I'm basically the world's laser agony aunt. I get hundreds of emails from people that are in trouble. And to try and help them out, I always need information. So I've been collecting information for many years now about different types of laser tubes, different companies, the way that the Chinese laser business operates. <sighs> I mean, I've got a database up here which nobody else has got. And so consequently, I'm going to be sharing some of that today. And it may seem a little bit offens offensive to some people, but I'm not doing it out of any malice or anything like that. These are all facts that I'm going to be giving you based on evidence that I've collected over the past few years. So the first thing we need to understand is what is the laser beam itself supposed to look like? Now you've heard me mention many times that the ideal form of intensity distribution within a laser beam is something called a Gaussian form and that's this shape just here. Okay now what happens then is we can find out whether or not you've got a decent Gaussian shaped laser beam by running something called a mode burn test. Now you've seen me doing mode burn tests where I take the standard beam unfocused and I fire it at a block of acrylic. And here is my 70 watt laser beam. That's a mode burn, 10 seconds. Okay, now does that look like that one? No. Does it look like that one? Yes, what I've got here is a model of basically the way in which you can check out your laser beam. This is far more informative than any 
power meter that you can grab hold of. As you'll see in a few minutes time, power and intensity are not the same. So here we've got a standard Gaussian laser shape. Okay, and what I've done, I've said, right, this is what happens after one second, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten seconds. So after 10 seconds, this is the way in which this beam will grow. If I do not have a Gaussian distribution to start with, I'm not gonna get this shape. Here we are, look, we've got a pretty mm, cowpat shape laser beam. It's pretty rubbish. It's almost like a camel's footprint in the sand. It doesn't go in very deep at all. And as I multiply that by one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten seconds, here's what I finish up with. So if your mode burn looks like this, then I'm sad to say that your tube is close to junk. It will work, don't get me wrong, it will still work, but it will work very inefficiently. I'm the world's agony aunt, and I get all sorts of information and pictures from people. I have experienced quite a few laser tube types because I've helped local companies, I've helped friends install and test their tubes. I think everybody that's got a laser machine will recognise the name Resi or Reki. You say tomatoes, I say tomatoes. They're renowned as one of the world's best laser tubes. Sadly, not by me. I personally have always regarded Resi as being very overpriced and very over specified. They claim to make high quality laces. I have no doubt about that at all. The quality is in the beam rather than in the manufacture. The beam, it can't be any better than Gaussian. So my question really is why would you pay two or sometimes three times as much for a brand such as Resi, whereas you can get exactly the same quality and lifetime out of another product costing half or a third as much. Until about two years ago, this website was full of all sorts of rather interesting and good technical information. Now, most of you will have a W series laser tube. And we'll just take a look at the W series laser tube. As it happens, they tell you here that they have now moved on to the third generation of laser tube which cancels the adjusting screws on both ends. Now the adjusting screws on both ends was in some ways, for me as an engineer, a super feature because it meant you can adjust the mirrors to give perfect Gaussian output. But I suspect that because they're adjustable, they didn't remain completely stable. And so now what they're claiming is instead the metal parts are made by high precision CNC machine. New firing technology used to join the metal parts and glass parts together directly. This technology makes very highly stable in the W series laser tubes. So they've moved on to something which is supposedly superior. And anything that's superior means that what was there before was not as good as it could be. I'm sorry, that's just my cynical opinion as an engineer. This site was full of very useful technical details. The only technical bit of information you'll find on here now is this picture, which is basically a 3D uh, special picture showing the Gaussian distribution of their laser beam. And I'm sure you'd recognize that as a little mountain, a 3D mountain. And this is as much technical information as I'm afraid you're going to get this little table here. Now this little table here is actually very telling, to me anyway, because I've also got a lot of information that goes behind this table that used to be on their website that's not there any longer. Now the reason I'm telling you this is because you may well have bought a machine from eBay or from Amazon Marketplace or maybe even a direct import from China that claims to be fitting a resi tube to your machine. Now, don't get me wrong, trust me, it will be a genuine resi tube because there are genuine resi tubes, there are genuine resi B-grade tubes, and there are genuine fakes. Now, the fakes 
are obviously there because this is a very high value product and if you can make something cheaply and sell it at a bargain price you're making a lot of profit. Here's a picture of a tube that somebody sent me. They were having a few problems with their machine and it's a resi tube as you can see and it's a genuine one because on the end here look there's a little Q code which you can put into your phone and check with the factory and it will confirm that on this date that machine this tube passed through their quality control department. Sadly this is not a warrantable resi tube. This is what I call a B-grade tube. Right, so we've got all our information on the screen that we need at the moment. Here is what the specification used to say up until about two years ago when Recky decided to completely revamp their website and rip all the valuable information away. When I say valuable information, it's also incriminating information because it shows they were not selling these tubes in a completely honest way. If you buy a resi tube from anywhere on the interweb, it will be claimed as probably a 130 watt tube because that makes the tube look really good. In reality, it isn't a 130 watt tube. It's only a 100 watt tube, the W4. Now, let's just read what the specification used to say. It said the working current, test current, is 30 milliamps. Maximum working current is 30 milliamps. The running current must be kept below 28 milliamps. And if you want to reach the lifespan of 10,000 hours, you must keep the current below 26 milliamps. Now, this is the last bit here which I'm going to explain to you in a minute is basically fraudulent advertising. So the first thing is, let's put this into plain English for you. The working current, test current, is 30 milliamps. Basically what that means is we will test this tube at 30 milliamps and you will get the maximum output power of 130 watts. That's what we guarantee. And the running current must be kept below 28 milliamps. So if we run it at 28 milliamps and test it, it will give at least 100 watts of output. So there we go, we've got a test specification now, two values. And if we take a look at this tube over here, we'll see, first of all, the agreement power is 100 watts, but the peak power never made it to 130 watts. This tube failed Recky's final test. It didn't make the specification, so it cannot be warranted by Recky. So what they've then done is sold this as a genuine Recy tube, but a B-grade to machine builders who will very, very proudly say that their machine is fitted with a Recy tube. They don't tell you it's a B-grade Recy tube. That's one bit of deceit that I'm not overly keen on. I mean, there is no deceit here in that Resi are clearly telling you honestly that this tube hasn't performed properly to their specification. Well, not true. You don't have access to this information that used to be on their website. So you don't know what their test specification is. So that's problem number one, a bit of deceit. Number two, Here's the genuine deceit. The lifespan can reach 10,000 hours if the current is kept below 26 milliamps. But hang on, I bought a 100 watt tube, which should run at 28 milliamps. Now, if I run it at 26 milliamps, I'm likely to get about 80 watts. So I'm paying two or three times the market price for an 80 watt tube. That's what I call fraudulent marketing. And that is why I believe they removed this information from their website. Here's a W1 tube. Peak power, 80 watts. W1, peak power, 90 watts. Hasn't made it. 75, there it is, 75. But it's failed to make the maximum test value. And here's a W8. W8, 150 watts, normal power, but it's not warranted by Recky because it should have 180 watts maximum power output. It's failed.
I just give you these as a few examples of how you need to be very careful when you buy what you think is a very expensive, high quality tube. The one thing that I can guarantee is that these tubes will not necessarily perform very well. You might say, oh yeah, but they're still giving me the, the agreement power, what I expected, you know, the normal operating power. But let's take a look at this particular unit here. Here's the calibration graph for that tube. That's percent power against watts. It does what most tubes do, high power tubes, and that is it goes up very, very quickly in a very short distance. If you look here, it's gone from about 10 watts up to 70 watts in 10% of your available power. You don't really want a high powered tube for doing photo engraving. You want this to be fairly flat so you've got a lot more control over your power. Okay, you've, This is basically a cutting tube where you've got lots of power. The yellow curve on here is the performance of this tube. It goes up quickly. It then goes up to 120 watts. In fact, it goes up to 122 watts maybe. But then it peaks out at about 60% power. That's totally wrong for a tube. A tube should continue to go up at its peak power. It should still be on the way up. In other words, there should be spare gas in the reserve tank to allow for this tube to depreciate over a certain period of time and lose some of its power and still be within the power at the end of the warranty period. So this is why it cannot be guaranteed by Recce themselves. The person that you buy it from is responsible for any failure that you happen to discover. But hang on, you're not likely to discover it because A, you've got nothing to compare it with, B, you're trusting that you've bought a super quality tube, and C, do you know what a good quality tube should look like? Everything is on the Chinese side of the scales. They're selling you something that has a very expensive tube and you believe is good, but it actually might not perform very well. So when I look at this graph, it immediately tells me that this is a B grade tube. It should go up, not down. The second thing that tells me that this is a B grade tube, and this is the more obvious thing. You remember what I said a mode burn should look like? Here's what this tube, bearing in mind it's 120 watts. This is merely 70 watts. Look at it. It's absolutely rubbish. It's very unlikely you're going to ever be use this to do any decent cutting work with. Yeah, it will cut, but it'll cut slowly. Not very well. It'll probably burn the edges as well because it hasn't got a sharp point to it. This is the real clue that you've bought a piece of junk. Power does not confirm it for you. The name does not confirm it for you. The price does not confirm it for you. This is the only thing that confirms it. That's what our beam should look like. That's not the shape of the burn that you're going to get from that. As I tried to show you before, we'll actually start to exaggerate the point because we've got so much power at the point here that it will start driving in much deeper. This is one of the key things that I need you to understand about the laser beam itself. Its shape, its intensity distribution is vitally important to its performance. Now I just happened to single out Resi here because I've got lots of evidence for lots of other unknown products that are really cheap products anyway. Now I haven't described to you at the moment why you must have a good shaped laser beam. You're going to have to put some trust in me at the moment and just accept the fact that yes, we really need the sharpest laser beam we can possibly get if we're trying to do cutting with these tubes. And the one thing about a powerful Reci tube or Resi tube is that it's designed for cutting. It's never designed for photo engraving. This is a cutting instrument and therefore it needs to have a sharp point, which if you buy a proper tube, it should have. This is the penetration from a W4 mode burn. Here's a W6 mode burn. Yes, it's slightly better shaped, but look here at the way in which we've got a lot of burn here. There's more power at the outside here than there should be. There is 
a little bit more relative power at the centre, but for a W6 tube, that should be probably right through here where my finger is at the end of 10 seconds. Yes, this will perform. And if you have nothing to compare it with, you will never know that this is close to a piece of junk. Whatever you do, do not assume that I'm having a down day on Resi. They make good quality tubes, as they claim. But some of their marketing techniques and their deceit to getting product into the market and getting rid of their B-grade products is deceitful. And you need to understand what the risks are. Now, I can only show you the evidence and make you cautious of what you buy. Now, for a long time, it's been a little bit of a puzzle to me. I could buy a tube that's twice the power, but not get twice the cutting ability out of it. But now, with my lens work, I'm beginning to understand more as to why that would be the case. As I've already described to you in several previous sessions, the one thing that damages material is light intensity, not power. You need power to create light intensity. But it's the intensity that does the damage and not the power. And let me try and explain that to you. When you buy a tube, it has a specified beam diameter. Now, if we go onto any of the websites, so here we are back at the Recce website. Does it tell me anything about the beam diameter? No. Here we are at the EFR website. Do they tell me anything more about their tubes? Not really. They don't tell me what the beam diameter is. So let's go and have a look at my favourite tube supplier, which is SPT. Why? Because they're honest. They tell you virtually everything you want to know. They don't hide anything and they do not over specify their tubes. They under specify. So let's take a look at their standard classic, as they call them, laser series. Let's take a look at the tube that I've got, which is the C70. OK, and we look at the technical brief information, product brief. So here we now start to get some decent information. Beam divergence. Now, that's a very important factor that very few people tell you about. But that is a standard factor that exists for all glass tubes. And I will talk about that shortly because it's a very important point that very few people even take into consideration. But it is linked in to what we're seeing here in this diagram in the background. So here we've got, look, spot diameter. Well, spot diameter normally applies to something after the lens. This applies to the diameter of the, what they call the beam diameter. OK, so it's anything from four to six millimetres. Not particularly tight, but what does that actually mean? Now, I'm just going to take you here to a, a university a website and we're quickly going to run down here to page 16. There's all sorts of lovely stuff on here if you want to go here. And here we go, page 16. Here's how they define the beam width. It could be one of two international standards. And we don't know which one is being specified here. I suspect that it's this one. Now, basically what that means is, look, we've got a beam here, which is basically 10 millimetres diameter. And what they're saying is that at this 50% intensity, so there's the Gaussian distribution with its maximum intensity at the top there, 100%. If we work down to 50% intensity, then that is the beam width. And if we take a look, the beam width there is about mm, just under two and a half. It's more likely to be, instead of a total of five, it's more likely to be four. We've got a beam width of 10, which they're claiming as a beam width of four. So in essence, whatever you see in the specification, you ought to be doubling it for your real beam width. So caution when you look at beam width, it's not quite what it seems. And the reason I'm mentioning that is because as you increase the power of your laser, the beam width grows. Now, as I've mentioned to you before, 
This Gaussian distribution graph has got two factors, important factors about it. Number one, whatever's underneath the graph, the area underneath the graph, has got meaning. And in this particular case, I'm going to say that that meaning is 50 watts. For that 50 watts, it just coincidentally happens to be that the intensity is a, a number 50. Now, the reason why I want to mention about beam diameter is because as we increase the power of a tube, so the beam diameter increases as well. I must keep stressing this time after time after time. We do damage to our material by virtue of the intensity of the light we're firing at it. Not the power. We don't fire 100 watts or 50 watts of power at our product. We fire a light beam. The power is used to elevate the intensity of the light to different values. So that area is 50 watts of power and we have an intensity value of 50 just because it's convenient. It's got no units to it, it's just a number. Okay, so if I keep the diameter the same and I double the area, effectively what I've done is I've doubled the power. And as it happens, I've also doubled the intensity. But wind back a few seconds to what I said, as you increase the power, you increase the diameter as well. So look, even though we've doubled the power from here to here, because we've changed the diameter of the beam as well, we haven't doubled the intensity, the, the ability to do damage to our material. We've only increased the, den the intensity by about 50%. So we've spent a lot of money doubling the power, but we've only got a 50% gain in damage capability. When you buy a tube that's double the power, it's not necessarily going to be able to cut twice as fast. But that intensity is not linearly related to the change of power. OK, so now I'm going to show you something that is an interesting puzzle. Now, what we're looking at here are two mode burns from exactly the same tube, more or less the same time, just a few minutes apart. But why are they so different? It's the same tube. It's the same settings, the same power. OK, before I answer that question, I'm going to take you back to something I mentioned a few moments ago. Beam divergence something that you probably never even think about. These were produced on a machine, quite a big machine. Um, I think it's got a 120 or 130 watt tube, but that's relatively unimportant because look, it's, it's, doing, it's doing a reasonable job. All right, so the tube is not rubbish. I think it could be better, but it's not rubbish because look, it's producing quite a nice Gaussian distribution mode burn here. What's gone wrong here? Yeah. Well, this guy has got quite a large machine. I think it's something like about 1.4 meters wide and about 900 millimeters deep. That means that his change of beam length across the whole of his table is 1. Point, sorry, 2.3 meters. So right at the back, we'll call that zero which is where he did this mode burn. And right at the front right hand corner of his machine, some 2.3 meters further down the beam, this is what he gets. Same beam, but why? Well, the answer is this factor that I mentioned to you a few moments ago, which is beam divergence. You tend to ignore it because most of our machines are small and we don't see a big difference. But when you get to a larger machine, it becomes very, very significant. So here we've got a tube which is great at cutting. And here we've got a tube that's not very good. Beam divergence is specified in the millirads. One millirad means the beam is going to expand by one millimeter per meter. If I've got three millirads, which is typical performance specification for a glass tube, then if the beam starts off at, say, four millimetres diameter, 
by the time it's traveled 2.3 meters, it's grown by about five or six millimeters. When the beam grows by five or six millimeters, here's what's happened in a very much exaggerated way. At the back of his machine, he's got his 100 watts on a seven millimeter diameter beam. Okay, in this particular instance, it's probably four or five, but this is the principle that's involved here. And he's got a certain amount of intensity. It goes right to the front corner of the machine, and what's happened is the beam diameter has grown substantially. And look what's happened to the intensity. As the beam diameter grows, the intensity drops off. And that is why we've got this massive change between the back corner and the front corner of the machine. You can see that there is a massive difference in the performance of his beam between the back quadrant and the front quadrant of his machine. All to do with this factor called beam divergence and the way it's going to affect the intensity of the light. Because as this diameter grows, for the same amount of power, the intensity drops off. So I hope I'm beginning to get through to you that this beam that you just take for granted, its characteristic is vitally important to the way in which your machine works. So right close to the tube, this beam has got a fairly small, let's call it footprint, beam diameter. OK, but as it gets further away, so that beam diameter increases. And as we've seen from the graphs, the beam diameter increasing changes the shape of the Gaussian intensity. So we've reduced the intensity here, not the power. The power under this curve is still exactly the same as it is here. But the intensity, the shape of the curve, means that we've got less intensity. And less intensity means less damage. Hence the reason why we've got those two massive differences in the appearance of the same amount of power. So everything we've seen here today is raw beam before passing through the lens. Now that's a completely separate subject which we're still going to have to tackle. What happens when these beams pass through the lens? And that's something that I'm still working on and making some decent headway on. That decent headway has enabled me to backtrack and understand how important and vital the shape of the beam is to the performance, the cutting performance of your machine. If you were drinking a cup of coffee at the beginning of this and you fell asleep, then I'm sure you've got a set of wet trousers now. Um, but if you manage to stay awake, then congratulations and I will see you in the next session. So thanks very much for your time and I'll catch up with you then.